Welcome. In this demonstration, we're going to show how seamless integration between electronic medical records and public health agencies can help facilitate patient care for providers and offer patients a way of giving proof of vaccination to attend events in the community. To begin our demonstration, our patient Riku has received two doses of the Moderna COVID vaccination. In order to attend an event in the community, he needs to offer proof of vaccination, but he's lost his CDC vaccination card. Luckily, he knows that through the MyChart patient portal offered through his primary care provider, he can show this proof of vaccination. When he first logs into MyChart, he sees only one of the two vaccinations he's received since he received his second dose at a local pharmacy. Since all vaccinations must be reported to a local vaccination registry, we can query that registry for his vaccination history and pull the information in about his second dose. And while I'm showing this in a web browser, Riku would most likely be using the, the MyChart app on a smartphone. And as you can see, we were able to pull the information in for a second dose, reconciling it into his chart without any clinician intervention. And with this QR code following the Smart Health Card standard, he can head to the concert to provide that verifiable proof he needs. And up next is Bruce with NextGen. Thank you, Aaron. My name is Bruce McGregor. I'm from NextGen Healthcare. Following the concert, Riku presents in the clinic requesting a COVID-19 booster shot. So using NextGen's EHR, I open our orders module and navigate to the immunizations tab to verify eligibility for the booster. Here we can see the patient's vaccination history and we can see a line item for COVID-19, but there's only one dose mentioned on file. So in order to get information to verify eligibility for a booster, we must query the immunization registry by clicking the reconcile button. Once we accept the patient information is correct, then the immunization registry is queried through multiple secure external systems to return the patient's vaccination history. The data returned is automatically forwarded into our reconciliation module. Here we can see there are two COVID-19 immunizations in the data being returned from the immunization registry. The first one is already present within our EHR, which is indicated by this chain link icon, and it is automatically set to ignore, so the data is not duplicated. The second shot is not present within our EHR, so therefore it is automatically set to add. We can now confirm the reconciliation, and the reconciliation process will then import the data into the patient's chart. Once completed, we can close the reconciliation module, and we will see that the patient's chart will update with the second dose showing now that they've had two doses of, COVID, of the COVID-19 immunization and the dates that they were administered. We're now ready to order and administer the booster. We do this by clicking on the new button and then we can search for the vaccine that we would like to administer. We find a vaccine from our inventory and select it and we say no to allergies since our patient has no known allergies. On the vaccine details tab, we can then select a lot number from our dropdown and selecting that lot will automatically populate all of the information that is specific to that lot. We can then set information for vaccine funding, the injection site, and the booster indicator. When we save the record to the patient's chart, the new vaccination record automatically behind the scenes is sent out to the immunization registry in near real time. Following the patient visit, I check my messages and I do see that there is an immunization export failure message in my inbox. This is stating that patient ethnicity is missing and patient race is missing. Both of these errors have caused the message to reject from the registry. So in order to resolve this issue, I'll go back to the paper forms that the patient originally submitted when they enrolled at the practice. I'll also make a note for my management to update the training protocols for our office staff, as well as updating the required field list within the next gen configuration to, allow, uh, to require these fields in the future. These will prevent these errors from happening again. So I'm going to set the race and ethnicity for our patient, and I'm going to update this information to the chart. Once that is completed, in order to trigger a new immunization record to be sent out to the immunization registry, I open up the uh, 
immunization that originally failed, and I click the Save button. This triggers a new record to be sent out to the immunization registry. Checking my inbox again, I can see that there are no additional messages, and this implies that we have successfully sent the information over to the immunization registry, and they now have RICU's complete COVID-19 immunization on file. I'll now pass it over to Katie from Shasta Networks. Thanks so much. My name is Katie Warner, and I'm the technical project manager for Shasta Networks. In this use case, Shasta acts as the HIE, so they sit in between the vaccine clinic and the IIC, facilitating the query and response messages, as well as submitting the VXU reports to the registry. With each VXU, the registry supplies an ACK, um, indicating the success or failure of those re uh, reports and supplying any errors. The errors come as either a rejection for required information that's either missing or improperly formatted, and warnings for uh, informational elements that are pertinent to research but are not necessarily required by the IIS. Um, as you can see in this example of output from a registry, uh, the user would have to have a fairly working knowledge of HL7 to be able to understand this report. And additionally, these acts are per individual uh, message, so they're not particularly readable or um, useful for action. Uh, Shasta's inform module, in a sense, will then aggregate these acts to provide meaningful actionable reports to the registry or the submitter. So taking a look at the dashboards in Inform, uh, we can see multiple locations since as an HIE we are sending for more than just one location, but we're going to go ahead and filter down to Riku's vaccine clinic. And here we can immediately tell that the majority of the vaccine reports coming from this location are being rejected. And if we scroll down a little bit further, we can get notification of exactly what the errors on those reports are, which is the missing ethnicity and race. Uh, additionally, for places that need to manually edit the VXU, uh, we can see the location in the HL7 for where that information is supposed to appear. The benefit of being able to see this on an aggregate scale is that we're able to identify trends, and in this case, we can see that there's a systemic change at the IIS, where previously this information was not required and now is. And we can export these reports and provide feedback to the submitter to let them know they need to update their training material and their workflows and make sure they're always collecting this information and sending it in the vaccine reports. And as an HIE submitter for multiple locations, this aggregation can be analyzed across all locations to provide information on data completeness, and errors to the entire region for the IIS. This can assist in the creation of recommendations for all submitters and updates to any regular regulatory requirements. And now I'll pass it to Damon from ERA. Thanks, Katie. Hi there, I'm Damon Ferlazzo. I'm with the American Immunization Registry Association. Um, acts communicate fatal errors that can um, that cause data not to be processed. Additionally, acts can communicate less serious information, such as warnings and information. These are sent individually, which can be a little overwhelming and hard to read, especially for non-HL7 v2 experts. Even experts can be a little overwhelmed when there's a large data volume. Last year, the Immunization Integration Program published the Acknowledgement Summary Report Guidance which indicated that public health, healthcare, and health information exchange intermediaries can all improve data quality by using ACK summary reports. These reports can be generated by products like Shasta's Informed um, Ascent or by the IIS, HIE, or EHR. Reports organize and present information that can be acted upon. Common errors and trends can be identified and prioritized for action. This is especially helpful when reporting requirements change, systems are upgraded, or new codes are released or deactivated. Reports can be limited to fatal errors that prevent messages from being accepted, and they can help monitor trends and detect new errors. Additionally, reports confirm corrections are made to immunization data exchange interfaces and improve data quality. Act summary reports provide opportunities to address errors ensure IZ um, data is accurate. Patients communicate, 
patients and, communi and communities are properly vaccinated, and we can serve limited resources, such as healthcare staff time or vaccination supplies. By summarizing acknowledgement data and distilling it down, errors can be more readily detected and acted upon. Now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Ashley from STC Health. Thanks, Damon. Hi, my name is Ashley McDonald and I'm with STC Health. At STC, we are the software supplier for about a quarter of the country's IIS um, immunization registries and approximately 70% of the uh, pharmacies use our network to transmit their immunization messages. What we're looking at here is Riku's immunization record. And as you can see at the bottom, it is populated with the dates he has received his immunizations. The top row of this, we see the three COVID immunizations that we have been discussing today, with the last one being the one just submitted by our NextGen partners a few minutes ago. Just above this, we can see what Riku is vaccinated for in the future. You can see he has not do a vaccine for quite some time. However, next flu season and or if a uh, new COVID bo booster should become something that he is recommended to receive, that is where this will populate and will be supplied to our partners via real-time HL7 interface connections. In addition to HL7 transmission, if a provider or a public health entity does not have the ability to consume HL7, we also provide a subscription um, service where they can receive vaccine updates. These updates do um, have to be approved by the jurisdictions of the population groups that these providers serve. But after that approval is received, the vaccine notifications for the populations in questions can be transmitted to these groups. Now, we've been discussing today the importance of data quality and the uh, data elements of race and ethnicity have been highlighted. Within our system, our jurisdictions and providers can go into the system and use the settings and co configurations to identify all data elements that they feel are crucial to that quality uh, of data and data completeness within their system. They can set um, these data elements to error or warn providers, send them back to providers for more information or for completion, and then the providers send them back into the registry where the information then is complete. Now, the reason why data completeness has been the most important over the last couple of years has, of course, been COVID. And with that, and the reason behind that is so many individuals need the information about their COVID vaccines um, quickly and easily so they can proceed with life. Now, at STC, we also have a consumer application. It's called MyIR. What we're looking at here is Riku's uh, vaccination record once again. This is the record that he can see as an individual, have on his phone, and have for easy um, access wherever he may need. As we scroll down, we see again what, e what Riku is due for next. And you can see too, he has the option of adding a child should he have a child. Um, what is very convenient about this, if you do have children, or if you have another need to need a uh, vaccination record that is official from the state, um, th you can access that here. These are very convenient for school entry or university entry. Additionally, Riku has the option of having his uh, verified QR code at his fingertips as well. These are often needed for travel or for entry to big events. They can also be printed or shared um, out to things such as Apple Wallet. And with that, I will pass it over to Vince from Cerner. Thank you, Ashley. I'm Vince Fantosi, a Senior Interoperability Leader with Cerner Corporation. We're picking up Riku's journey now that he has had his uh, COVID booster shot. And unfortunately for Riku, he has started to develop symptoms that align with COVID-19. So he decides to quarantine. During his quarantine, his symptoms did become worse, and so he presented at, his, at the emergency department here at his nearest hospital. Here we're in PowerChart in a provider inpatient workflow, and we can see here in the banner that at registration, 
the Cerner system triggered the record retrieval services to look for any outside information available on Riku. This includes the Cerner hub immunization, sending a HL7 QBP query out to the state registry. As that RSP response comes back from the state registry, it'll get those records would get deduplicated. With any other immunizations, we also found on CDA documents that would be retrieved from national network connections, such as a Commonwealth Care Quality, um, or any local HIE connection that we might have here with our health system. It'll also get compared to the local record to make sure that the new immunizations from the outside are not something we already have here in the local record. Because the state registry is a trusted source with our hospital, uh, we do allow the data to directly write into the local record, uh, which we can see here in the history. This allows our care team to understand his vaccination history, including the fact that he has already been uh, immunized for COVID-19, including his booster dose. In the detail pane, we could still see the where the record came from, even though it's in our local record. Uh, you can see the transmitting source is the state registry, and that this booster dose that we have highlighted came from that was administered at the NextGen clinic. This helps our care team um, get this information without having to document new immunizations or review and reconcile those, recon those uh, immunizations that were administered outside of the health system. So moving along, the ED physician notes the chief complaint of headache, fever, and malaise, as well as Riku's occupation as a full-time middle school teacher, and decides to place a back order for a COVID panel. The panel goes to the lab and unfortunately Rico has tested positive for COVID-19. A lab technician would result and behind the scenes the electronic case reporting fire services have already started to look through Riku's chart for matching reportable condition trigger codes on 1, 6 and 24 hour intervals. And when one of these results or diagnosis, one of these trigger codes are found, an initial electronic case report will be generated and sent to the AIMS platform as a CDA document via direct messaging. The AIMS platform will use RCKMS decision support to determine if the case is reportable and to which public health jurisdictions. The case report itself does support multiple fire resources so that we can include helpful information for those public health investigators, including those immunizations that we recorded from the state registry. So they can document this as a breakout case, for example. This helps those investigators save precious time instead of having to dig for all these types of information that they might need to truly understand the case. The AIMS platform will also send back the HL7 companion reportability response. This can be viewed in the EMR at multiple locations. Uh, it can also be viewed as a structured document, as we see here uh, in a CDA viewer, as an example here. The reportability response, response can also be shared with multiple members of your care team using discern rules. So as this reportability response comes back from the AIMS platform and the public health jurisdiction, you could push that to an infection control team member, for example. What we hope you've gathered today is that using industry standards, we're able to help patients individually. We're able to help health systems meet reporting requirements in a automated fashion, whether at the um, ambulatory or acute venue, as well as the state registries. And importantly also, we're helping the public health jurisdictions make sure cases aren't falling through the cracks so they can do case detection and other important functions such as contact tracing as an example. So with that, that includes our presentation today and we really thank you for joining us.